splash down in the water, watch the mud rise up. Dress me like a lamb for the slaughter, pour me in your cup. Should've known we'd bring trouble, and trouble gonna find you here. Trouble. I was one way when you found me, I was not the one you see. And the only thing that happened was this stranger in between. And you can say your eyes are open, you might think your hands are clean. Till the wind blows in, the dirt kicks up in ways you've never seen. I'm scraping the bottom, make my well run dry. Shake them coins, I know where you got them. Kiss me, kiss me by. Should've known we'd bring trouble. Trouble gonna find you here. Yeah, trouble. Stranger in the tree, you can say your eyes are open. You might think your hands are clean till the wind blows in, the dirt kicks up in ways you never seen. All right, we are on, we are on. Yes, Colin, we are on. Look, everybody, we're on now. Look, this is the team. I am with the team, the chosen team. Some of people are out. Unfortunately, a couple of them have COVID. A couple of them couldn't make it here, but I am talking to you in Midlothian, Texas, permanent home of the chosen. And we are in town for a retreat and for team building and for talking about how we can serve you better in 2022. Look who else I have with me. How excited are you to be on a live stream? I'm so excited. Yeah. Amanda loves being on <laughs> live streams and she loves talking to you, but we're the reason she's here is to keep me calm and also because soon we're going to be talking about this. But tonight we have so many things in store for you. We've got uh, new gifts, one of which I am wearing, another one she is wearing. Uh, I will get back to that in just a second. We're going to talk about our vision for 2022, one of the main things that we're going to be covering uh, this year, kind of our main theme. Uh, I'm going to give you some season three updates, yes, and I actually have some dates for season three. I haven't heard dates. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. This See, this cool. is how much I love you, is that I'm even, I, some <laughs> things even, new this is. you know, Jesus said some things he, only the Father knows. Wow. Some things only I know. Wow. See how that works? I just think we lost like a thousand viewers. Am I comparing just, myself to God the Father? I think that's just what happened. Let's move Let's on. Let's just pretend I on. wasn't. Uh, then right. we're going to show you, we have a, a, a glimpse of the brand new sets that we are building, the sound stages that we're building here in Midlothian. I want to give you kind of an inside tour of that. And then we've got a really cool uh, video for you that's going to talk about, we're calling this the three miracles. This is the three miracles of season two that happened that really show just what 
God did in the chosen in the last year that was changed our lives really changed your life certainly sure. changed my yeah. life we'll talk about all that we got some Q and A we uh, Chris and Chris took your top questions most frequently asked questions over the last few days gathered them together assembled about five or six questions that uh, we'll be answering for you and of course there's chat live chat right now so while I am talking to you right now I want you to say something in the chat whether it's even the number one or where you're from we want to get the chat going we want the algorithm to get unlocked on YouTube and on Facebook and the people that I'm hearing behind me they are taking your questions right guys right so that is the team <laughs> so excited but <laughs> that is the team that is faithful to you so when yeah, you ask questions sure. they are constantly on there trying to keep you uh, uh, engaged and keep keeping your questions answered and then um, we'll also address uh, near the end of the, the night a little bit of chosen controversy that's popped up Ooh. just recently yeah and uh, I'm gonna address a little bit of that and, uh, and then of course at the very end I will introduce you to our staff I really want you to know people who are working so hard. And one of the reasons we are here uh, meeting this week is to talk about all the, the ways that in this year we can serve you better and uh, really get the show out to a billion people around the world. Uh, also, <laughs> one more thing before I get into all of this, the app, the chosen app. If you are watching this on YouTube, hello. If you're watching this on Facebook, hello. But you really should get the app. Download the Chosen app, it's completely free. And if you think, well, I don't wanna watch something on my phone or I'm scared of technology, it's super easy. It's super easy. Super easy yeah. and it's totally free. And when you uh, do it, you can actually cast it easy and free to your streaming device. Yeah, I can't figure anything out technologically and I can figure this out. So yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. Super so easy. get the app and that's where you can watch, that's where the show looks the best and that's where you could be right now on the, uh, on the live stream, which is the best way to do it. Okay, gifts, we have gifts. So, this is the new chosen gift. I'm wearing it right now. See what it says in the back. Sometimes, Sometimes you gotta stir up the water. Yes, frequently requested. This is the final line of episode four of season two, <laughs> when Jesus says, "Sometimes you gotta stir up the water," yeah. and walks off to that kick button. Music. Awesome. Kick yes. Button. <laughs> so we've got this yep. jacket, the zip up. You've got a what's called a raglan. We've got people yep. wearing wearing it. Uh, Jenny, stand up. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. This is Jenny. She's wearing the, the yes, the raglan. Oh, she's walking um, a runway Chris here. Chris Durbin, come here real quick. Show the t-shirt. Right here. He's got the sometimes you got to see the water t-shirt. Um, Daryl, stand up. Show what else we got. Tie-dyed, because cool people do tie-dyed apparently. <laughs> and so we cool. are cool. Yeah, I'm not cool, so I'm not wearing the tie-dyed. Someone else. Oh. Galibe, come on. I'm also wearing the tie-dyed. Yeah, show the tie-dyed. Yes, very cool. Yeah, sometimes it, Jenny just keeps Jenny walking. Jenny just back keeps and walking. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah. uh, we do have pullover hoodies. Now, here's something that's very important. You can get all this, of course, right now at www.thechosengifts.com. No, they're not going to. Okay, so um, here's the problem. So the good news is we've got a really cool new line of apparel and gifts that... Uh, start conversations and are a key thing, you know, key theme of our show, key theme of our whole team is that we are trying to be a little bit disruptive when it comes to the stories of Jesus. But these items, some of them are actually quite low in quantity, meaning these will probably sell out in the next 10 minutes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually not exaggerating. Um, right now, supply chain issues, right now it's really tough to get materials from all over the world. We have done everything we can over the last couple months, but there are just some things, and you're, you're probably finding this not just on our website, but in other places, where there's just not anything in your size. And because they're just running out of things, and that is just demonstrably true. So we have gotten as many as we can, but there are limited quantities of, Bob, talk, talk me through it. The pullover hoodie, Bob Starnes is one of our uh, apparel gurus, our gift gurus. Limited quantity of pullover hoodies. Yep. Yep, limited quantity of this even, yep. the thing that I'm wearing. Um, We're good on these. Good on these. We're great on... Yes, come on in, <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> she, <laughs> Sheila who could swim in this thing. Um, she stole someone else's size is right. what she did. Gen Z look. Yeah, yeah, that's the Gen Z look for sure. So, uh, but we're limited on, on, on these. And, uh, but we have plenty of that t-shirt, we have plenty of the tie-dyed, and we have plenty of this, uh, what's called the raglan. That's our friend Adam who just spilled. So here's what you need to understand. If, you, if there's something that we are out of, um, you might not you find that out until you go to check out. 
And if that's the case, I'm sorry. Uh, I really am. Uh, just be prepared for some disappointment uh, with some of these items because we just have low quantities of them. But that's why we did so many varieties. So you can find something for you. And I'm telling you, uh, if you are the type who says tie-dyed, I wouldn't wear that. I haven't worn that since the 70s. Or that's what druggies wear. Uh, oh. It's not true. <laughs> Not, that's not None true. of these people are, are fit that description. So, Such a strange thing to say. They, they, had to, they had to sign that when they got the job. So, but it's what the cool kids are wearing these days, right? Like, doesn't yeah. our daughter wear our like kids? Tie-dyed? Yeah, I think it's way graduated from being a, a druggy look. Yeah, for sure. So. so make sure you get it for like if you've got a grandkid or a teenager or whatever. That's the one to get the tie dye. So we got plenty of that. I'm just telling you, limited quantities. But here's the okay. other main gift that we have. Hold it. The Bible study. This is called Blessed, Blessed Are, the, Are the, Chosen. the Chosen. And uh, Amanda here did the bulk of the work on this along with our New Testament Bible scholar, Dr. Doug, Doug Huffman. And yes, who's who, amazing. Yeah, he's Always amazing. amazing. He was our Bible professor in college and we brought him on to the show. He is our official evangelical consultant and a tremendous Bible expert. And the first Bible study um, did extraordinarily well, impacted just an innumerable, innumerable amount, of, amount of people. We just got hearing about that all the time, about how much the Bible study impacted them al along with uh, either as individuals or in small groups. And the second one is now here. So this is based on season two. Talk about what's different about this one from the season one Bible study. Yeah, it's similar format, um, similar length, um, but it's really different and just the, the subject matter is, is brand new. So we based it off of the Sermon on the Mount, which is where we see season two build toward. Um, and we just talked about what it actually means to be blessed, the blessed statements in the Sermon on the Mount. The blessed, Beatitudes. Yeah, the Beatitudes. Yeah. Blessed are the um, peacemakers. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. This whole um, sermon that Jesus gives, I actually always looked at the sermon as stuff you have to do in order to be blessed by the Lord. But what I learned um, through doing this Bible study is that those blessings are ours already when we follow Jesus. And so it's really total, a total shift in our reality as followers of Jesus, what, how the favor of God is already upon us in all of these amazing ways. And so um, it's, it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful sermon, duh. Um, but understanding it, it, it just, it, in, in an entirely yeah. new way is so cool. For example, like lesson one, the poor in spirit. And so that's the blessed are the poor in spirit. And it shows, look, for example, this is like bios of James and John, the sons of thunder. And it talks through what it means to be poor in spirit and what, what J Jesus actually meant by that. And then it just takes you through each, each, um, each chapter corresponds with an episode. A blessed statement and with yeah. an episode of the show. Yeah, so. so if you remember, and when Jesus gave the Beatitudes at the end of episode eight, we show you what was taking place throughout the season that matched some of those things. And so that's one of the things that really adds to this uh, Bible study. But there's just so much rich material in here. Uh, the first one um, uh, continues to be a big impact. And the second one, of course, goes along with that. But this is available now at thechosengifts.com. Months and months have gone into this. Um, I say this every time, but if you're new, I want you to hear it again. We do not do these just to be promo efforts for the show. No. Uh, the show is just a merely a stepping stone. We say it all the time. It's just a show. I know it's meaningful. I know that it's changed a lot of lives. It's changed my life. But the show is a means to an end. Uh, when you watch the show, hopefully you know and love Jesus better, and hopefully you're drawn to things like this. Um, I want to read you something real quick um, that was really powerful to me when we, when we got this note. And it was about you. It really speaks well of you because it speaks to not only what hopefully we are living out as a result of a book like this, but when we wear the, the chosen gear, the chosen gifts, and we wear that publicly, those are meant to start conversations, but they're also meant, and sometimes in many ways, to be a marker of who we follow. And uh, I got this note uh, just a few days ago. I'm a flight attendant and noticed one of my passengers wearing a The Chosen sweatshirt. My colleague and I were working in the back and having a conversation as people were waiting to deplane. She spoke about how tough it was to make ends meet as a single mom, that she couldn't afford to have dinner at the hotel or even spend $100 on new shoes. She was actually wearing shoes like bright blue tennis shoes, it says, even though she wasn't wearing, she wasn't wearing the official company dress shoes. This person who was wearing a chosen hoodie turned around and said something like, something like this. I hear you and you matter. I want you to have a nice meal and you deserve new shoes. 
I want you to have this to help you. You are a beautiful person and Jesus loves you very much. A lot of it was inspired by, of course, the moment in, in uh, season one when Jesus says, I see you. As he pressed $100 into her hand, she started to cry and said, thank you, you don't know what this means to me, over and over and over again. My eyes welled with tears of joy for her too. Then he pulled out another $100 and gave it to me and said, I want you to have this too. I am a Christian and the Bible tells me to give. Again, she, and she says, I'm not sure of the exact words, but that was the gist of what he was saying. The fact that he did this in obedience to this prompting from the Lord, wearing the chosen sweatshirt was just beautiful. His name is Tim, and I thought you would enjoy hearing just a ripple of what your obedience to make the chosen has done in our world for, for Jesus' sake. So thank you for making that happen. And when, again, that's one of the things that we want with this, is when you wear this gear that ma makes a statement in many ways. And over time, as this thing grows and the movement grows, more and more people know what this means when you wear it. So thank you for being part of that. So uh, on that note, I want to talk about season three, but uh, and, and what our theme and vision for is. But season two, Blessed Are the Chosen, Bible study, in there now. You're done if you want to go sit down. I do. Yes. Thank you, thank you. All right. So uh, Amanda is done. Uh, season two Bible study available now at thechosenguest.com. All right. So season three is what we are calling unofficially. Well, no, I want to get it. I'm going to wait. You, you got to remind me. See, year of the Unreach, 2022. I will get into the season three updates in just a second. So uh, 2022, we are calling the year of the unreached. And what this means is, is that our primary focus, not our sole focus, but our primary focus is on reaching uh, groups of people that we have not reached yet with this show and with the message of this show. So that includes uh, groups, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's age groups, minority groups, whatever, that have not been exposed as much to the show. That is something that's going to be a focus of ours in our ad campaign. It's going to be a focus of ours in our messaging, even in our social media. Um, and particularly, this is going to be true internationally. And I know that you're watching around the world right now and you're thinking, when are you going to get more, like, for instance, the apparel that we're wearing? When are we going to get some of that? We are working on that actively. But our international efforts are going to really be ramped up and focused on this year. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be able to get some of the things that we've, we're offering here in the States. It's still going to take a long time. But when it comes to our social media, when it comes to our efforts to uh, translate, get the show translated, dubbed, subtitled in as many languages as possible, that really ramps up this year big time. And I want to tell you one of the main reasons why, besides the obvious, besides our goal to reach a billion people uh, with the authentic Jesus, is what happened in France recently. So last month we had a premiere of The Chosen in France. Big premiere at this theater. There were hundreds of people who showed up. A few of our actors were there. And uh, they made a big deal out of this because there happened to be a television station, a pretty prominent television station in France that wanted to show all of season one of The Chosen as a marathon on, in one day. And there was a group of people there who were really passionate about the show. And as you know, France is not necessarily a country that has, has nearly as much of a Christian presence or a uh, presence of shows or movies like this especially compared to any other countries in Europe or around the world. And so they were really passionate about bringing the show to France. And so they had this big, huge premiere. And then they did that marathon before Christmas, all of season one in one day. And it did extraordinarily well. Uh, so the at first episode had half a million viewers, a little under half a million viewers to start. And it played throughout the day. Well, here's the problem. I mean, that's amazing news, right? And, and so many people were shocked that, that a show like that was playing on national television in France. But... We don't necessarily right now have the means, the resources to support what happens after people watch the show. You know, they want to they want to look for season two. Well, what, what, the, the, our social media presence in France isn't as robust. Um, our foreign language efforts aren't as robust. We don't have as much of a presence there, particularly with gifts and other items as we do in the States. And that's happening around the world as the show is growing and people are spreading the word around the world. But yet we don't have the same infrastructure here uh, there that we have here in the States. And so our team, even today, was spending time making sure that we are focused on our efforts towards those who haven't seen the show yet. Now, that doesn't mean that you, some of the super fans who are watching right now, uh, obviously we're still going to make sure that you are served well, but you're also going to be part of some of these efforts. We're going to be giving you more resources to spread the word uh, to people who don't have the show yet. And there's a lot of people who've heard of the show, a lot of people here in the States even, who've heard of the show but who haven't watched it yet uh, for various reasons. And we're going to do a lot of things to help them overcome some of those hurdles, and you're going to be a big part of that. So I just want to let you know that that's our big vision for 2022 
and we're calling it unofficially the year of the unreached. It just means those who we have not reached yet with this show. And uh, there, of course, are going to be some people who just don't want to watch it, never want to watch it, and that's going to be okay. But we're going to be focusing our efforts and our communication on that. So I hope that you're going to be part of that. Now, season three. Season three, we now have some dates, okay? So I am, as we speak, putting the final, final touches on the scripts. Scripts are starting to be distributed to our cast. Crew and cast are starting to be engaged. And we are now targeting. Uh, it is going to be, we are going to be begin filming of season three, either April 18th or April 25th. Uh, COVID has a little bit to do with that. There's a couple of projects that are going on that some of our people are involved in that if they get pushed, we want to have a little bit of room for that if possible. Um, there's a lot going on that I'm going to get to in just a second when it comes to set building. We want to make sure that we've got uh, a little bit of room and time for that. But it's going to be either April 18th or April 25th is our shooting date. Now, of course, that could change based on COVID or based on other factors. But that uh, we, all, we have all gotten together. We feel like that's a realistic timeline. Now, the more important question I know for you is when does it come out? Well, we don't have an exact date for the release of season three yet, but we are aiming for the fall of 2022, fall of this year. We want to have the entire season released before Christmas. Our goal is so that especially if you're thinking far ahead, that week before between Christmas and New Year's where so many people are gathered that they have a chance to binge watch the whole season. We can't guarantee that, but that is our goal, is to have the entire season released in some way before Christmas, ideally as early in December as possible. Now, we're going to also be releasing episodes long before that, you know, several months before that. We don't know exactly, again, we're, we're working on it, but we don't know exactly what the cadence will be, whether it's one per week or whether it's we're launching two in theaters to start off. I think that's going to be a very likely scenario that we might do something similar that, to what we did with uh, Christmas with the Chosen, where we launched in theaters for a bit. And uh, if we do that, just so you know, we want to do that all over the world. Uh, so that is our goal for the release, is, is launching it in theaters around the world. But some details still need to be worked out. But no matter what, the show will be available to you sometime this fall. And, uh, and then it will be all out, I promise you. Or, well, I shouldn't promise. Our, our, every every intention, every fiber of our being is going to be working towards getting the entire season out to you uh, before Christmas. So I know that you might be thinking, why is it taking so long? Well, I, we want it now. Um, now, just so you know, yes, it used to be the pattern where a show came out once a year. Uh, now it's a little bit different when it comes to streaming some shows, like you know, Stranger Things, for example, comes has come out. When was you're a nerd, Chris? When was it's been about two years? Yes. Um, some of our favorite shows sometimes take a really long time to come out. We're really trying to get into a cadence where it is once a year. But that brings me to the thing I want to show you right now, which is the set construction, which is the fact that the, building these permanent sets um, are a huge part of our of our plan going forward. And once these sets are finished, and once the, the, the uh, sound stages and all our buildings are done, then things move much quicker. So for example, Ryan and Tyler and myself have already started working on season four scripts. So season four scripts will likely be done in the fall, excuse me, in the fall or near the end of 2022, which means we will be able to get going on season four in early 2022 earlier than when season three was started because the sets will have already been built. And so we will have such an infrastructure already in place and the scripts will be done by then. And so we will be able to get going earlier than normal. And then that cadence will become the norm where we're trying to get at least once per year, maybe even once in less than a year, but we want to get these out as fast as humanly possible. It's just so many things are going into season three prep that, uh, that it just, it's, that's taking longer than normal course but thank you for your patience that's one of the reasons why we gave you Christmas with the Chosen was to tide you over to some extent we still have a ton of great content including what I want to show you in this very live stream in just a few minutes but let me take you behind the scenes um, uh, of the set construction so uh, you know you know Chris and Chris uh, Chris Durbin and Kristen Lagore who are kind of your eyes and ears and our eyes and ears in many ways. What we, we brought them on to take your questions and give them to us to have a finger on the pulse of what you're doing to get behind the scenes uh, in times and places where I can't always get to, and then to not only communicate to you from us, but to communicate from you to us, right? Did I say that right? I think so. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so I'm gonna show you this video that Chris went to the, to the, to the set construction to, give, to, to get an update. And uh, as soon as he is done, well, he's already done it. I'm going to show you this video right now. As soon as that's done, I'm going to give you kind of the why of, of the set building and, and why we're doing it this way. But uh, let's go to that right now. This is Chris Durbin on the set and to give you this uh, update on the construction. Well, how about we, we kick this whole thing off with the most basic of questions? <laughs> I mean, we're here to look at a soundstage. What is a soundstage? 
Well, uh, I am not a film guy. <laughs> but you're building it. So. Yeah, you're yeah, building it, though, so yeah. Pretty perform, but, uh, but a soundstage is effectively a place where you can film. Uh, it, it removes all of the exterior sound. And it also makes a space that doesn't have a, a reverberation or an echo, so, it, so okay. it, it, it's, it's conducive for filming in inclement weather, in rain, when there's planes overhead, when there's trucks outside. And it just reduces that sound. It makes an ideal space for filming shows like The Chosen. So what you're saying is, is you're here to make Dallas really happy that when planes fly overhead we're inside of a sound stage where we have more of that element of control over the sound and the visual and everything. Correct. That's really really yeah. cool. Well let's just take a look around this little area here. I mean look at this build. What is this building right here? What are we doing there? Well, this will be the workshop or the mill where they, where they build the sets. This is going to be the props and set deck where they, props where and they set deck? store okay. the sets. So this building over here is, yeah. is going to be a multi-purpose building for, for eating. Uh, there's going to be obviously a, a, a mess line or a chow line. This building will be for um, hair and makeup okay. as, as well as for wardrobe. Wow, and everything literally is right here then. Yes. So like you don't have to go anywhere. No. So you don't have to go anywhere. So uh, effectively the, the, the actors will be in, their, in their, their star trailers. They'll come in, they'll get set. And then what you don't see behind this building is the soundstage. So they'll, they'll move from here straight across the, the road into the sound stage ready to go. Whoa! <laughs> this is huge! <laughs> look at this! <laughs> Just look at that! This is pretty awesome. Wow! Yeah. So here we are standing in what is going to be Fort Capernaum. Well, can you give us a virtual tour of uh, what's, what, what, what's going to be where and sure. what's coming? Certainly. So, so uh, as you look towards the lake, there's going to be a sea wall, four foot seawall over a, along the lake uh, on the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Uh, as we look this way, th this whole area all the way out to the sea is going to be Fort Pernum. It's going to have all those sets that you've seen in the past, plus some sets you're going to see in, in, in future seasons and in future episodes. You know, Matthew's house. I think it's got Quintus, uh, Gaius. Quintus Gaius. All those houses are in here. And as you look up the hill, you're going to see the synagogue up on top of the hill, and that synagogue is is, is really cool. It's, it's it's been designed after what we believe the the um, the synagogue in Capernaum looked like. You know, Jeff and James have done a lot of research and tried to duplicate that that synagogue. Well, give us a tour of this. Well, well, so we're, we're up here on the synagogue, obviously the highest point in the city, looking down on where where the the city of, of Capernaum will be. Uh -huh. And uh, as we come forward here, you're coming to the front of the temple. And then right here, we'd be going down the temple steps into a, a beautiful courtyard here with a fountain okay. just in front of us here. I mean, this is amazing. Like, I'm just blown away by how much more detailed this is even than season one. And I thought season one was pretty darn good. Season two was pretty darn good, too. Season two was pretty darn great. We, we yeah. keep raising the, the, the bar and, you know, it's like it's guys like Tad, James, Jeff, the, you know, John from HTX Dirt is making it all possible. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So where are you going to do season four now? What do you got? What are you going to do to up it even from this? Oh man! Well, <laughs> there's a great guy by the name of Dallas Jenkins. I think that's a great question for him. I don't want to answer that. Dallas, we, we throw that one to you. <laughs> what are you going to do to up all of this for season four? We'll have to find out. All right. So I feel like I'm a newscaster or something, having it you know back to you, Dallas, from Chris. But thank you for that handoff, Chris. But the the question about season four, um, the fact is. We do obviously have more in store for future seasons when it comes to the story, and there will be times when we go back to the extraordinary Utah set, uh, especially, especially because that's uh, Jerusalem, and so we'll be spending uh, a lot of time in Jerusalem in future seasons. But um, here's one of the cool things about season four. When you say, well, what's gonna, what are we gonna do differently? Well, that's one of the beautiful things about the set is that the set now gives us a permanent home, and so that when it comes to season four, we've already got some of that infrastructure already built. Now, I wanna give you real quick the why. Why are we doing this when we didn't do it for seasons one and two? Um, well, one of the main things is, is that, yes, those sets have served us really well in seasons one and two. For example, there's a, a set in the middle of Texas that we were able to use at times. There was a set in Utah that we've used. And then, of course, on this property, uh, the Salvation Army property, we used a lot of the exteriors like out in the fields. And that's where we filmed the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but what we haven't had is a permanent home that we can build to our specifications. And so building to our specifications that allows for the, some of the unique needs of filmmaking, we haven't always had. And especially our unique needs because we're obviously a unique show. So building this now with our unique needs in mind has been a huge deal. The weather factor is huge. So a lot of times in film and television, you have what's called a cover set, which is you're filming out in the weather, it's really cold or it's really rainy. And then, and Chris, I think, uh, touched on this a little bit, but 
it's really cold and really rainy and you need some place to, do, to go. Well, we weren't able to go anywhere because we were subject to the availability of other sets, other sound stages that were built in the, in the Texas or Utah area. So we didn't have any place to go. So we would just, and sometimes we'd have to miss a day of filming or we'd have to stop early. But having a cover set, having the ability to have everything right there, we can go in and film on some of those indoor sets is a huge factor. The time and money we're gonna save by being all in one spot is massive. Uh, by uh, you know, but that was another thing is going to another sound stage. We'd have to get the entire um, com- we call it company move, but we get the entire company cast and crew have to transfer hotels, which no one ever wants to do, especially when they're doing it long term, and go to a new location where we're set up for a week and film on a different set. And that costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time, and that's uh, very inconvenient. But having everything in one spot is a huge deal. So we're going to be saving a ton of time and money in the long term, and uh, that's a big deal now. The other thing is this long-term use. What about when the show is over? Well, that's one of the reasons why it's worth putting the money and the investment into this plan and into the the soundstage, into the permanent set, because this isn't going to be just for us. We believe that long-term, this can be used for other projects similar, that have a similar mindset to ours, that don't have necessarily access to the kind of resources that this soundstage and those first century sets will provide. Also, the Salvation Army has camps every year for uh, kids, kids. They have free camps sometimes for underprivileged kids who come during the summer, and this will give them a first century biblical education. The Salvation Army will be able to use this because, again, it's on the Salvation Army property. They have been such extraordinary partners to us and allowed us to be able to do this, and they're going to benefit from this as well. And the kids are going to benefit from this. It's going to be a long-term, um, lifelong benefit um, where they're going to have an interactive Bible experience uh, in first century history and Bible exper- uh, education that's going to be extraordinary, as well as having the opportunity to learn things like filmmaking and learn about behind the scenes of the set. And people who want to come visit the chosen set are going to be able to do that long term, but we're also going to be using this for other projects uh, that are not only ours, but other people's. Uh, we want to be able to share this where we can. So there is a huge long term benefit to this, and I just wanted you to be excited about it and know that once it's set up, we're going to be ready to go right into season three, making full use of this thing. We want to use, the, the, we take this very seriously, the opportunity and the resources that we've been given and uh, this is going to have an impact for years and years and decades and generations to come okay so i want to read something else to you very briefly before we go into um the three miracles video okay uh that is uh got this other this is a short note but it says so much and it has a lot to do with uh, what i'm about to share here real quick i started reading the bible for the first time and my husband and i went to church last week we've decided it felt so good we're going back every week I even want to volunteer some time to my church. This show did that for me, and I couldn't be more thankful. And that is B. Dolan. Started reading my Bible for the first time, and the show did that for me. Um, And again, that's where things like this come in. The Chosen Bible Study, which is designed not only to go deeper. I want to point out there's a section in each of these these chapters. uh, And it's called, I don't know if you can see this, it says, For Bible nerds like us who want to know. Is that showing up, Colin? So I don't know if that's showing up, but for Bible nerds like us who want to know, and then it goes even deeper. So there's these sections in the Bible study that go even deeper, but it, but, but for the most part, this is for anybody at any level of their faith or, uh, or, or, or lack thereof. This is an opportunity just to go deeper into the meaning of the Bible. And so this uh, season two Bible study, Blessed Are the Chosen, uh, at thechosengifts.com. I'll do it one more time. www.thechosengifts.com. This season two Bible study uh, is available uh, now. And um, this is what we do. We do this because of people like uh, this person who is now reading the Bible for the first time. And the show is not the Bible, as we've told you. In fact, a good chunk of the show is not from, directly from the Bible. And so we want those who've been introduced to Jesus or through the, the, the Christian concepts or to the biblical concept because of the show, want to point them in the direction of, okay, well, here's, here's what the Bible actually says, and here's how you can uh, use the, the show as a resource, but ultimately it points you to God's word. So that's what this is all about. And of course, right now, I am sure, I'm not checking the chat, but I'm sure in the chat we are seeing many people say, oh, they were out of this or they're out of that or how can I get this? Uh, this chosen gear. Sometimes you got to stir up the water, which is one of our, our messages. Adam, come, just run across real quick and show them the, the, the shirt. Run, run, run. There it is. 
And then tell them that you're the one who dropped the bottle in the kitchen. I'm the just, one that dropped the bottle in yeah. the kitchen. My right. apologies. This is Adam Swerdlo, our COO of The Chosen, wearing the uh, tie-dye. Tie-dye variant. I love tie-dye it. Shirt. I actually have the other variant underneath. I just love it so much. I needed both. Like the plain one? Oh, look at you. Sometimes you got to stir up the water. And you know how like the water is stirred up? You get that? So, thank you, Adam. In season two, there were several moments that we call Red Sea moments. And I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But these moments uh, have changed me and have changed uh, our lives and have impacted the show in many ways. And I'm sorry to say that it's me talking all right, so I know that this live stream has already been a lot of me, and I apologize for that, but this next video is something that we did last year because we wanted to memorialize the things that were happening, A, so we don't forget them, so that we never lose sight of what God has done in the life of this project, but B, because we want you to know what you are helping make happen through your prayers, through your paying it forward, uh, through the purchase of the gifts. Uh, and if you're overseas and don't have access to some of that stuff, I know the way that you're spreading the word and praying and all of that has such a huge difference and it makes a huge influence, it makes a big, a big difference on the show and in our lives personally. So I'm gonna talk about that, but this is something we did last year and I really want you to see it. This is called The Three Miracles of Season Two. And um, when we come back from that, we are gonna answer your top questions. We're going to address a little bit of chosen controversy that's come up recently, and you're going to get a chance to meet the staff. But this is a, we don't know if I'd call this a documentary, but it's a long form video. This is not our usual little two or three minute video. This is a little longer than that. Um, that's going to take you deep into, into what God has been doing. So check this out right now. Man, it's funny. I get, I get emotional remembering it because I was so, I was just so hopeful. In the Old Testament, there's this moment when Moses and (laughs) the Israelites are running from the Egyptians. This is their escape from Egypt. And they get to the edge of the Red Sea and there's nowhere else to go. The only thing that's possible is for them to go through it. And of course, they can't go through it. So God parts the waters of the Red Sea. There's this concept of what my wife now calls the Red Sea moment, which I find myself in and the show finds itself in on a regular basis where you do everything you can, and then you get to this moment where you've got nothing left. There's nothing more you can do to accomplish this seemingly impossible task. And getting comfortable in that Red Sea moment where you're just waiting is probably the hardest thing that I'm ever having to do. And on season two, there's been three in particular that were really significant, where it was just shown to me over and over again that I'm I'm not fully in control of this. Season two is significantly bigger and different. It's in a new location from season one. So we can't go back to where we filmed season one. And we're looking at places all over the world, but COVID's making it difficult to travel. Uh, None of us really want to go overseas for three months. And in the States, there really aren't too many, you know, first century uh, sets uh, other than one. There's a huge one in Utah. For a couple years, I had been hopeful that we could get a set like that. But every time that the opportunity came up, the answer was no. It's never actually been done for anyone outside of the the LDS church, so I'm not going to get my hopes up. So sure enough, I get a call from a guy by the name of Brad Pello, who is a fan of the show. So he calls me up and he says, I think that there's an opening. I think the church is willing to consider this. I'd love for you to come visit the set. And I literally was like, (laughs) okay, I think Maybe there's something opening up. Maybe I can get my hopes up just a little bit, so I'm gonna go visit the set. So I go to visit the set, and it's the most extraordinary film set I've ever seen in my life. I felt like I was transported to to the first century. Like, this is what it feels like, this is what it looks like, and it was just extraordinary. And I felt, like, not, of course, not an audible voice, but I felt God, like, speaking to my heart. Lives are gonna be changed from the content that we're going to get on this set. I just felt a kinship with, (laughs) with this, concrete structure. And we were up against a deadline now, and the answer is no, we can't use the set. And I texted my wife, Amanda, and I said, they just said no. And I, and, and, and she says, call me. He says, so we're talking on the phone. I go, they just said no, and now I have no idea where to shoot. And Amanda just goes, yeah, I don't think so. She says, I just think God's taking you to the edge of the Red Sea so that when the waters part, you'll know it's him. And I kind of chuckled and thought, stop it, like stop getting, I, stop getting my hopes up. Like they just said, no, I'm done with this. The decision's made and we need to, be, we need to 
find a place to shoot now. So I went to the farm where we made this Christmas short film about the birth of Christ that went viral and launched the entire project. I don't have answers. And the reason that I'm here on this farm is because this is where I go. It's owned by a very dear friend of mine and it's where I go about once or twice a year when I really want to hear from God. I get away from everything and I just try to listen, um, which is something I'm not great at. There's this amazing song called Faithful Now that's done by Vertical Church Worship, which is the part of the church that I was part of for seven, eight years. And there are these lyrics of this song. I am holding on to faith because I know you'll make a way. And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see, but I will believe it. I will believe it. And that's just the song that was like laid on my heart, saying, look, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't, and I don't understand, but I know something will happen, something positive will happen. And long story short, in the middle of July, another gentleman wakes up at four in the morning and feels led to call up one of the main leaders of the LDS church and said, have you seen this thing? We have got to make this happen. We, why aren't we using the set for this purpose? This is why the set was built. Like we've got to make this happen. So I end up getting this Zoom call in the middle of July with two of the top leaders of the entire LDS church. And I just said, look, if we're not supposed to be shooting on this set, I don't want to. I, I just want to do whatever God wants. I just want to be wherever we're supposed to be. But I just laid out, here's the point of the show. Here's the mission of the show. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell these stories of Jesus in an authentic way. And your set is, in my opinion, the greatest opportunity literally in the world to do that. But we have to know now. And they believed in it. They liked it. We had a great talk. And then they had to get a decision from even higher up on the chain of command. The final decision makers all left for the month. They said, I don't even know how we're going to reach them, but they ended up sending an email. And the next morning, uh, we got a phone call that said, uh, Goshen set is a go. You're gonna be there in August. And it was like that. It was like <laughs> Red Sea parted like that. And I'm of course completely gobsmacked and I'm, and I'm emotional. And you know, I get the text, I'm downstairs and I, I walk up and I just, you know, cause I'm, I'm I'm emotional even now thinking about it, but when I was with her, and I just show her the text. And she's not emotional because she's like, yeah, I know, like, told you. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't say it in a kage way. It was just like, yeah, I know, it's, this is, so now you know that the Red Sea parted and it wasn't you? Like, yeah, yeah, I got that. For season two, that was the first Red Sea moment, and that was actually the first time Amanda came up with that term. You know, I think God is taking you to the edge of the Red Sea so the waters part, you know it's him and uh, mission accomplished, because we for sure knew <laughs> that one was not us. We've gotten to the point on this project where the fact that we're even doing this is insane. The fact that we're able to do a project like this completely outside the system, that's 100% free, and yet we're able to do multiple seasons of this thing, um, financed by people all over the world, is extraordinary. Well, we might as well keep trying to do extraordinary things, trying to do impossible things. And we paint ourselves into these corners, just, <laughs> I don't know why we do it, but it's kind of like, hey, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep trying for, for crazy things. So we had this idea for uh, the opening of episode three of season two, where what if we did the first 15 minutes, this whole sequence in one shot? We call that a one-er. And we've done it before, but usually for like uh, two minutes or you know, three minutes tops. Uh, we did it in season one, for example, when Simon and Andrew are walking down a street and they're talking and we just did it. And it usually takes like nine or 10 takes because something always goes a little bit wrong. An actor might mess up a line or the extras in the background, might, the timing might be a little bit off or there's an audio problem or whatever it is. So you just start over and you just do it again. Because you have no, you can't make any mistakes in a one because you can't cut around it. It's like theater, actually. In theater, you don't get to stop and go again. What so if you mess up in this tape? Uh, you ruin the day for everybody. Yeah, we have to start all the way over. Yeah. So, uh, so no I pressure. Will, uh, yeah, I will not be stuffing right. up, hopefully. We're thinking, Let's do it for 15 minutes, which is unprecedented for television at least. Um, and let's also do it in a scene where there's gonna to be tons of people and tons of movement. Uh, it starts 
in this line of people where Matthew and Philip are walking through and then they go backstage behind where Jesus is doing all these miracles and there's seven, eight people and we're gonna be weaving in and out in front of them. And we just thought, stupid, ridiculous, highly likely to fail, but uh, let's go for it. Because if it works, it's gonna, it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna really fit the storyline, it's gonna fit the moment, it's gonna add to this intimacy and to the urgency of the moment and playing things out in real time. So, what do we need to do to make that happen? Well, we need to rehearse a lot. So you get the actors out there and you spend the morning, the entire morning rehearsing. Normally you rehearse for 15 minutes and then you shoot all your different angles for the next few hours. Well, we spent the whole morning before lunch rehearsing. We're gonna be rehearsing for the next several hours. It's gonna be clunky, it's gonna be like theater. You know, when you're first getting on the stage and you're mapping things out and figuring out where people are walking to and where they're gonna stand and um, so, I've, I've, I've given this kind of speech before, but it's never been more true than it is now, which is you just have to all really be patient. And we brought in this specialist um, named Chad who has a special rig that he can do, a special steady cam that allows him to move even more so than the average steady cam. Typically, when you have the camera in one direction, the, ca the crew can be behind the camera. But in this case, the camera's gonna be moving around all the time, so the crew can't be anywhere. A few of us hid into Jesus' tent, so you actually see Jesus' tent in the shot, and we uh, closed the tent so you couldn't see us, of course, but that's where we were watching the monitors. So we thought, let's get a good one during the day, and then once we know that that's our safety net, we know we've got a good one, then we can take the chance of trying to do it during magic hour. Our first couple takes don't work at all, which we expected. And then we're like, all right, well, the sun is starting to go down a little bit, and so we start this take, and we're like, we better hustle. And about a third of the way into the take, the shadows are so extreme, you can literally see the, the, the whole camera crew on the, on the actors. We've done three or four takes by this point, and none of them are usable, and we're done for, meaning we can't shoot for the next couple hours. We have to wait until the sun is low enough that there's not gonna be shadows, but then that brief window where it's low enough, no shadows, but you can still see people <laughs> before the sun completely goes down and we're done and we didn't get it. And here we are again, Red Sea moment and I'm out in the field by myself, arms outstretched. I know that God has many bigger things to, to worry about than one shot of my show. But what I was just saying was, look, if we're not supposed to do this, one or if this is just a bad idea, can you just please make it obvious so we don't keep wasting time? And so we come back, the sun was going down and, and our cinematographer said, we're gonna lose light totally in 20 minutes and the shot is 15 minutes, so we need to go now. So we start rolling and one of the actors says a line wrong. So we go to take two, and now we've got 17 minutes for a 15 minute shot. Same thing happens. And I walk out of the tent, I take my, my script that I have in my hand and I, I, I throw it to the side because I'm so upset and concerned. And I go to the actors and I go to the crew and I calm everybody down. I go, okay, you know, we can, we can do this. Let's just relax, take a deep breath. We gotta stop thinking about everything and just let the scene happen. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I'm walking back to the tent and it's, we have 15 minutes for a 15 minute shot. Like this is it. And I get back into the tent and we start rolling. And right away I can tell that the actors are relaxed. The performances are actually better than they've been all day. One minute in, I'm going, oh, this scene is the best it's been. Like, this is really great. That's gonna be really painful if something goes wrong now. And as we're watching it halfway through, because the camera is away from the monitors, so the signal goes out, I can't even watch it. The cinematographer can't even watch it. We're just staring there at a blank screen. <laughs> and it was almost like God was going, I'm taking away everything from you. And I'm like, I can't even see. So I'm just staring at a blank monitor, begging to be able to see something. Finally, the monitor comes back up. I have no idea how the past two, two minutes went. And one thing we noticed was like, look at the lighting. Oh my goodness, this shot looks so unbelievable right now. You can see the sun going down in the shot. This is extraordinary. One of my producers, Chris, is standing next to me and we're not looking at each other. We're, we might as well be holding hands, but we don't even want to jinx anything. So we're just, I, I can feel the, our breath, our, you know, increasing. We're just going, Oh, please, oh, please, like I just know what he's thinking. And there are a couple moments when the actors, you could tell were slightly pausing in their lines because they were working out and going, oh, please, oh, please. At one point, the camera operator, we see the, the camera jolt a little bit near the end because he, he was, his arms were 
shaking so hard that it was all he could do just to hold it steady. And we could actually hear his breathing through the microphone because he was so exhausted. Man, it's funny, I get, I get emotional remembering it because I was so, I was just so, I'm stressed is the right word, but I was so hopeful. It took me back to the moment in the Old Testament when Moses has to ha have his hands held up. And as long as his hands are held up, the, the, big, the, the, the battle's gonna be won. And his hands are, his arms are so tired that he literally has two people holding his arms up. And I felt like through prayer, I wanted to be holding up the arms of the camera operator so he could keep the camera going. We finally get to the end of the scene and they deliver it and it's awesome. And the cinematographer turns back to me because everything looked great from his end and he's like, please tell me we got it. And I'm like, I, th I think we got it. And I walk out and the camera operator is literally collapsed. They're pouring water over his head because he's, he's so overheated and drained. He's just collapsed and sweat is pouring down. They've taken the camera from him. And we look at the monitor to watch the shot. It's the most beautiful shot of, 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 the, of the season. And we got it. And I just, I literally, I walked over to one of the actors to thank them and everyone's clapping and cheering because we, we couldn't believe we got it. And I just burst into tears. I just started crying and he's like, are you okay? No, I'm just... Dude, oh, dude. Dude, that was a lot for everybody. Dude. What's funny is the, the, the lighting in that last 15 minutes was even better than it would have been five minutes ago. Even the mess up of the actor made the shot better. If we could have chosen, no pun intended, the best 15 minutes of the day to shoot this one shot, it was those exact 15 minutes. There was no reason to feel confident going into that last take because we'd done takes before and none of them had worked. So when your evidence for potential success is just multiple examples of failure. It's not exactly the most confidence-inducing moment. If anything defines a Red Sea moment on this show, that, that moment was it, because I was, I was literally powerless. It's, it's a place I'm learning to, to, to be in quite often now. The best example, obviously, of a literal Red Sea moment in many ways is when you're stuck because of the weather. It's been a challenge constantly to overcome the weather uh, on this show. Throughout the show, it's, it, the stakes were relatively small. We could kind of get through it. The Sermon on the Mount day was super cold, but we were still at least able to film. And so we got through that. But the biggest one was coming up near the end of the shoot. We had a day of filming on the lake. This was one of those days where we only had one day to shoot in that location. We weren't gonna be able to do it again. Also, we had a couple actors who were scheduled to leave the next day, in one case, to the case of George Xanthus, who plays John, he was flying back to Australia. And so we had, we had to shoot on that day, and in the days leading up to it, I'm talking to Amanda, again, the person that I go to when I'm in a Red Sea moment, I'm going, you know, we got this day coming up that's looking like thunderstorms, and I don't know if we're gonna be able to make it, and this is gonna screw up our entire shoot. And she says to me, I feel like it's going to be fine. And she just said, I feel like God has just laid it on my heart that you're going to be protected from the weather. And I chuckled again. I don't believe that the chosen is going to dictate the weather for the entire area, but she just felt like we were gonna be fine. So we get to that day and good news is that morning there was no rain. And I'm thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. Bad news is, is that at the beginning of the day, at least there was fog that was so thick, you couldn't even see 20 feet into the water. It was unshootable. We have two big scenes to shoot that day, a total of about eight or nine pages, which typically takes minimum 12 hours in a day to shoot, but that's pushing it. That means we have to work really, really fast. And the, the radar is telling us that this fog isn't gonna clear up until around lunchtime, which means we'd have half a day to film two big scenes. Not possible. My co-writer, Ryan, is on the set with me, and we are already starting to think about what are some of the things we can cut from these scenes or what are some angles we can maybe give up on so that we at least get some footage. Another hour goes by and this fog is getting thicker. And we're approaching lunch and I'm like, we're, we're, now the radar's telling us it's not going away till two o'clock. And so I text Amanda again and I go, um, we haven't shot, we're four hours in, we haven't shot anything. I don't even know if we're gonna be able to pull this off. And she says, start thanking God for what he's going to do. And I'm like, yeah, a little too early for that. <laughs> She's like, it's gonna be good. And I'm like, stop it. And I walk out, you know, 20 yards into the water, standing in the middle of the fog. And I do my typical, like, God, feels like another Red Sea moment. 
can we get an idea? Can we at least get a decision soon so that we can figure out what we're going to do? Uh, we decide to go ahead and break for lunch. And now we're halfway through the day and we've got nothing. And then we find out from the radar that the fog's going to be here until the end of the day. So we're done for. So I go to the actors and I go, guys, um, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to shoot today. And we decide to make the decision, all right, guys, go ahead and go. And I'm in the makeup trailer talking to the actors, which is about half a mile from the actual set. And I look out the window and I go, is that the lake? Because I can see through the trees and previously it had just been a big wall of fog, but I could see the water, which I hadn't seen all day from where I was standing. Like, is that the lake? And I start hearing yelling, the fog is clearing, the fog is clearing. Don't go, don't go, don't go. But we pull them all back and we're rushing to the edge of the water and I get there. And they told me at, at, that they were literally taking the boat that we were gonna be filming on one of the scenes and they were pulling it into the harbor and starting to put it onto the truck. And they were standing there and they said this gust of wind came. It was literally like, whew, and the fog just went whew, off the lake so fast that they could see the other side of the lake in, in, in seconds from when they had previously not even been able to see 20 yards. And they all started you know, yelling in the walkies, oh my gosh, the lake is good, get the boat, get the boat back. Yeah, Mitch was like, all of a sudden he could see that. We and started, then, and then they started the second the we started saying we're gonna put the boat away, we started putting it away <laughs> and we were like, oh, I can kinda see the trees a little bit. And we were like, weird. And we started seeing those, that shore and we were like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then, it's like, Adam, Adam. <laughs> it's like a horrible horror film. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> so we get the boat back and the crew is running. We get to the edge of the lake. The actors are getting there. And my cinematographer, Akis, says, okay, well, the sun's going down in two hours anyway. So at most, we, we can only do one scene. And I said, uh, I'm going to try to get both scenes in. He thought I was joking. And I go, if we just do this scene in one or two shots, then we can go to the next scene, which is in a boat. Simon and Andrew are out in a boat on the lake, which is very difficult to film. But I'm like, we could just get that in one shot. So we film a couple takes of this first scene, which is the four uh, disciples throwing rocks. And it goes fine. And we're like, oh, the light looks good. Let's keep going. We end up getting all the angles that we wanted because the light still looked great. We filmed this four page scene in an hour and a half, which is unprecedented. It normally would take us five hours. And we're like, all right, let's get the boat out in the water. Let's try to get one shot off here. Sun's going down, here we go. So we get the boat out in the water and the waves are coming a little bit too, so the boat's kind of rocking, so we have to have two guys literally holding the boat in place. I'm like, all right, let's get one shot off. We've got two cameras set up, let's just get this. And my cinematographer goes, well, we're here, let's just do it again. So we do it again. All right, well, let's get the other angle. So we get another angle. The, the clouds in the sky were reflecting the sunlight. We ended up getting every angle that we had planned on. We shot both of these scenes, the one on the, on the shore and the one in the water, eight to nine pages in three hours. And my cinematographer said, it felt like the day just kept extending. And I didn't even have time during the filming because we were going so fast to text Amanda and go, hey, we're gonna try to get a shot off. So the, the day ends and we've got everything. Everything that we needed in three hours. And I walk by myself, I go off by myself again, and I start crying again, going, Red Sea moment. And I remembered that when I had gone out into the water and I had had my hands out and just saying to God, I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, my wife is telling me to thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. That feels pretty ridiculous right now, but it'd be nice for something good to happen here because I don't know what to do. And it's again, one of those situations where as a director, I have, I'm completely powerless because I can't control the weather. I can't clear the fog. I can't extend the day. And it happened. And even the fact that we were able to shoot in three hours doesn't make any sense. It's impossible math, which has been another phrase that came from my wife that has defined this entire project. And I texted her <laughs> and I said, so uh, we, the fog finally cleared in five minutes and we got absolutely everything we were gonna get for the whole day. And of course, I'm a mess. I don't know how, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, but that 
was near the end of the shoot and it was the, the capper, the, 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 the exclamation point on this entire season of saying, I, of God saying to me, I want you in these Red Sea moments. I want you in that place where you've done everything you can and the only thing left is for the seas to be parted. And in this case, it was the fog being parted. It, was, it felt like the most literal example of a Red Sea moment I could face. And if I continue to need to learn that lesson, that's okay. Because every time it happens, I'm so grateful for the reminder that this project is not mine. And I used to be someone for whom that would be a really scary thought. And now it's the best place to be. And I feel more content and joyful being in this place of surrender and desperation and helplessness. There's no better place to be than that. So I've talked enough, so I brought Chris Durbin on. Uh, but by the way, uh, Daryl just walked past and <laughs> while the video was playing and said, this is, these are his loaves. So <laughs> this is Daryl's loaves and fish. Uh, I'm keto, so I don't eat bread. But uh, thank you, Brad. For, <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure what that was all about, but Daryl's loaves are literal, apparently. So Chris, yes, uh, you and Kristen, who unfortunately is not with us right now, right? Uh, I, I was going to say she's no longer with us. Yeah, no, she's, she's alive. She's very much she, alive. She's very alive and well. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, maybe not well, but yeah, alive. Yeah, she's she's uh, recovering from COVID. Uh, did did well with it, right? She's yeah. not she's not uh, doing too bad. Uh, it was it was mild, but uh, unfortunately couldn't join us for our staff get together. So she's not able to join for the questions. But you have been. Talk about this, how you went on Facebook and got questions yep. from people. So, I mean, I did a post on the fan page asking people what, if you could ask Dallas and the crew anything, what would you ask? And we got a lot of great response. The social media team back there is awesome because they take it and they put it up on this board that Kristen and I could go to as well. So we find those comments, they're collecting those comments. And so it's very cool, like how we're able to keep the pulse of everything. Yes, and, and, and speaking of the fan page, they yeah. just look up on, on Facebook, chosen fan page. And uh, there's a lot of things there that sometimes we put that you can't get anywhere else. And uh, it's, a, it's a huge collection of people who just love to talk about the show and, uh, and talk about some of the issues around it. And it's really cool. So check that out if you haven't yet. Is so, that where the controversies come from? It's from the fan uh, page? Sometimes, but uh, not, the, not the one we'll talk about Got in, it. in a bit. So yeah, good question though. All right. Well, our first question, Jamie Jackson, wondering what excites you all about season three to the extent that can be said without major spoilers? Okay, so I think the thing I'm, the, the one or two things I'm most excited about I can't share because they're major spoilers. Um, but I'm excited about the feeding of the 5,000, which is going to involve thousands of you who will be there um, live and in person. I don't know how we're going to pull this off, uh, but we're, we're going to try and we're going to look forward to it. But um, at, one of the things I'm excited about the feeding of the 5,000 is that, as we always do with The Chosen, it's not just... We just get to the, you know, and then Jesus went to a hill and started to feed 5,000 people. We take you behind the scenes and give backstory and cultural context and historical context of what leads up to that. So that when the feeding of the 5,000 happens, it matters. And that the miracle that takes place means something to the people involved in the show. And so it's not just something you get to in the Bible. So that's a big thing. And the other thing that I'm really excited about is Simon and Eden. Uh, we take a lot of time. Um, they, they, are, they are featured pretty prominently in this show and in painful ways at times. Um, obviously, uh, there's, there's redemption, but, but it's going to be a difficult season in some ways, not just for them, but for others. This is, again, more of what it means to follow Jesus and that it's not always uh, uh, butterflies and rainbows. Now, you, for you, maybe. Right. For, for you, it's just been a breeze since you followed Jesus. But for, right, it's a breeze. Yeah, yeah but for sure. the people of the sure. first century, uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't the people who were directly following Jesus. And so we look at that. What is it like? Eden thought she was okay with Simon traveling as much as he was. But what does that look like practically? And uh, so we explore some of this. I'm really excited about that storyline. Um, we, we really had a lot of fun um, and pain, but, but good, the good kind of pain in writing that. And I really can't wait till you let me read the scripts. Yeah, uh, I can't wait because it's going to be a really long time before you read this. Oh, course. good. Sorry. Okay. All right, so you kind of addressed this, but just so she's represented, Shirley Lehman has asked if once the soundstage and sets are built in Texas, will it mean that you guys can film each series more quickly? Yeah, each season. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. So yeah, we've already, we've, I think we've already addressed that to some extent, but yes, um, once these stages are built, which is going to be in just a couple months, 
Uh, and then while we're filming in one part, the other part will continue to be built. Uh, it will continue. Uh, it will allow us to move so much quicker in future seasons. So we'll be able to get right into season four so much faster. Nice. Well, uh, Patricia Vaughn is wondering, after the feeding of the 5,000, what will be the next big crowd event? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't even want to think about that right now. Um, I don't know, and I honestly don't. I, I, I think there's a decent chance we won't do something like that again on the set, at least. Um, uh, we're, you know, we're happy to have done it. Uh, once we're done with it this time around, we'll be happy to have done it. But uh, it really is a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to pull off. Uh, we're, we just do it because we, we love you so much and we want you to, to experience this as much as possible. But uh, I don't think that'll happen again on the set. I don't think we have any, any scenes planned for that big of a crowd. Um, but we are always looking for opportunities. In fact, there's a, we've, talked in the, we've talked recently even about uh, different ways to launch a new, new episode of the show and maybe doing a, a tour or, uh, you know, what, think, think about this. What, do you, what would you think of this, Chris, sometime in the near future, like doing like a premiere of a season in like AT&T Stadium in Dallas? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Like getting Let's do you that. Know, some of our friends like Phil Wickham out there and getting a few people, Brandon Lake and whoever, but like doing like a big live event to show uh, episode one, but like in a stadium. Like that would be a great crowd. 50,000 yes. people all to watch. So that may be, that, we've talked about that happening sometime in the future, but, uh, but after, the, after this feeding of the 5,000 happens, we're all going to, we're all going to collapse. Well, that's good. My wife won a raffle to be in the feeding of the 5,000. She did? She won a raffle. Yeah. Wow. So she gets to be in the feeding of the 5,000. Sweet. The raffle on, on the fan club page, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, the fan club has these, we have some, we have some people who, uh, uh, Sherry is one of them who organizes these, these raffles and little uh, opportunities for people to uh, get to the feeding. And uh, it's pretty cool. So Mary Bang says, how do they make everything in the scene feel fresh and impactful when they sometimes do the scenes multiple times? We always do the scenes multiple times, other than that one shot that you love so much from it was awesome. episode three of season two. Uh, but typically we film the same scene no less than, uh, I would say total of about 15 times um, with just a couple of takes from each angle. So it's two to three, ang you know, we'll, we'll shoot an angle, we'll shoot that two or three times. And we turn around and do a different angle two or three times. And we do a larger angle two or three times. So maybe it's, maybe it's not quite 15, um, depending. Our actors now are so locked in and have been doing this now. We have such a good rhythm together and our crew is so locked in and have such a good rhythm that we're able to move a lot quicker and do fewer takes. Um, but in terms of the question of keeping it fresh, that's just what the job is. I mean, you know, Liz Tabish is someone who uh, we all kind of are in awe of because she's had the most emotional moments of anybody. Um, and how does she keep it fresh? I, I, I genuinely don't know. It's, it's, um, it's, it, but but it's, it's her life's work. I mean, it's what she does for a living and it's training. It's also caring deeply, having the passion for the material. I know that our cast really loves this project and loves the script. And so that tends to make it easy. It's my job as the director to come up with ways to keep it fresh. Um, and sometimes that just means little, little tweaks here and there after each take. I mean, you've been on set, so you were able to see. Oh, yeah. After each take, it's like you go in and you make little tweaks, and sometimes that unlocks things and helps things become more fresh. But yeah, that is the, that is the secret sauce for actors, and that's why it's not as easy as some people think. Yeah. Some people think, oh, I could do that. And uh, it is a business, it is a job, it is hard work, and especially on a project like this, it's really intense. It requires a lot of focus and a lot of emotional availability. Um, so yeah, we have an we have an extraordinary cast. I mentioned Liz specifically just because she cries all the time, but uh, <laughs> every one of our cast members is is a giant of of talent and uh, and openness to the process. Yeah, it was amazing on the messengers to watch like four or five hours on one little thing of dialogue. Well, and you think of of, uh, of Sarah who is playing uh, Mother Mary who's delivering a baby, and over having and to over. have the, the yeah the same intensity and the sweat pouring down and all that and grinding her voice and, and, uh, and Raj playing Joseph and he's doing the same intensity doing that over and over and over again. Yeah. Petra G says, what is one thing that has changed in you personally during the filming of the show? Well, I think you just saw it. I mean, the season, the, the three miracles. I mean, that, the, what, we, uh, what we talk about as a team and just the other day, uh, the chosen staff, we all gathered and went around in a, in, a, in a circle and we just talked about what's one thing, and which is what this question is, what's one thing that impacted you during, uh, in the last year, in 2021? Um, from, from whether it's the show itself or more, more importantly, your interaction with a fan or with a viewer or with um, someone that you know who's been impacted. And 
we were talking about this, you know, 95% of it really isn't about the content of the show, even though uh, our, we're all impacted by that, but it was about a relationship with someone. You talked about your dad mm-hmm. um, and just how people were impacted by that. Suman, come here quick. So, Suman, come on. I know you were, she was not at all prepared for this, but when we asked something that impacted you in 2021, you don't need to tell the entire story, but you've had more than one person in your life. So can you just share really quickly, just for you, how you've been impacted? And by the way, it's not Suman, it's Suman. Suman, yes. yes. Um, but uh, she came on board. She's a member of our social media team, and uh, she came on board as a huge fan of the show. It impacted her so significantly. And one of my my main tests for whether an episode was good was to make sure that she cried when she watched it. <laughs> and, uh, and so far we're doing all right. But what was, uh, you were just sharing with me earlier about a friend of yours, but what, what in 2021 really impacted you about working on the show? Um, for me, there's a lot of things, but um, for sure, it's just the impact that has happened from me being on the show and from me being able to invite other people to come and see. So not just my brother was the first one who told me to come and see the show. Mm-hmm. And then I was a little hesitant, but I did it anyway. And I loved it. And then I ended up telling other people to come and see. And with that, one of my best friends, he ended up getting baptized a few months after watching the show and you know, getting to know more about the Bible. And it's been a wonderful experience. He had us come and see shirt and he got baptized. It was a great thing. But also for me, another- and You were saying he's now foots under the category of I was one way and not, I mean, he's exactly. completely different. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And the change that he's had over the months has been immense and it's been very quick and you can, it's a clear testimony um, of how God worked through the show and through me and through everybody mm-hmm. who's been working. And another thing is I got to bring my grandparents to watch the Christmas special last year. And uh, my grandparents are not, I mean, they are religious and stuff, but they're not really into what I'm doing right now. And um, they obviously have, uh, have been taking some time to adjust to what I've been doing because um, I'm Indian and they want me to go become a doctor, doctor or a lawyer <laughs> or an engineer and that's not the path that I took. And for them it was a little difficult to kind of adjust with it but they still came and watched the Christmas special and my grandma doesn't really understand too much English so it, it's, it's tough for her and I was a little worried that she wouldn't understand a lot of it but she told me that she understood the entire thing and she was really excited to see what was coming up and she just wanted to watch more. And she's like, is there more, is there more? And I was like, well, there's a whole two seasons to watch. So yeah. it's been very exciting. And to see the breakthrough that's going to happen in my grandparents' lives through the show is yet an amazing testimony and something that we all will get to witness at some point in the future. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you, Suman. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that, that we, we have those kinds, all of us have those kinds of stories and, and uh, God is doing something in us, and that's one of the reasons why I think he's doing something in the show. So final question comes from Allison Lewis. My question for Dallas would be, what is his favorite and least favorite part of making The Chosen? Oh, wow. Um, well, my favorite part is this, like what you just heard, and, and how, um, you know, my, my, dad, my dad, who's an author, says, I don't know that I love writing, I love having written. And, uh, and I think that's, I think that applies to me a little bit. I love having made a season and all of us having made a season because then I can look back at the impact that it had while we were doing it, but then the impact that it has on people. So I think my favorite part is, uh, is watching it with other people or seeing the, 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 the impact that it has, that God is doing. I also, I really do love working with the cast and crew. Um, uh, the, the, the people that we get a chance to work with, um, that really, even though it's difficult every day is just a slog, but getting to do it with those people is really cool. But I think my least favorite part of it is, um, honestly, the the time that it takes to write, for example, like writing is really, really hard. And uh, Ryan and Tyler are better at it than I am. And so when it's my turn to do it, um, oh my gosh, I just, finding the time, finding the focus, uh, find, you know, I feel like every time I'm writing, I have the most amount of distractions of the most uh, emotional and spiritual warfare that takes place. It's just so challenging. And uh, I hate, I hate that part of it. Uh, and then it becomes good when I'm done. And then I'm like, oh gosh, gosh, look what God did. And so that becomes a fun part of it. Uh, but, but that writing part of it, not, not, uh, that's, that's, that's tough. That's my least favorite part, I think, is the yeah. process of it. So I know that that's sad, but it's true. So thank you, Chris. Yes, Thanks thank for you. Those were some of your top questions that we saw. And uh, keep them coming in uh, social media and in the chat room, and we're trying to do our best to answer them. But uh, you may... I may depart. You may depart. All right. That might find a more comfortable <laughs> seat. So I want to talk about something real quick. Um, we talk... Uh, I use the term controversy. 
Um, that might have been a bit of a loaded term, but I've been seeing as the show is growing, we've been hearing about some fans have been bringing it to us, investors have been bringing it to us, an increase in the number of videos and posts online that are specifically uh, designed to criticize the show, to warn you against the show. Uh, you'll see a lot of these videos where they use the show, they use the title of the show, and a, 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 a clip, we call it clickbait sometimes, big words talking, you know, using the chosen because it attracts more eyeballs. And uh, it's usually something where they're trying to expose something about the show or expose something about me. And uh, of course, 99% percent of the things that they say or use are things that are actually public and out there so it's not like there's a there's not much dirt to come up with it's all it's all public but one of the things I wanted to say is um, I don't personally care it doesn't bother me I, I when, when we decided to do this show we knew that this kind of stuff would happen and some of it's some of it's actually sincere and legitimate and people have fair uh, debates that they want to have with the show and and uh, and the show itself is not perfect and uh, and even even when I even when we feel strongly about something that doesn't mean that others are going to agree with us and sometimes very rational debate can take place over these kinds of things and that's awesome we love that kind of stuff I actually love the fact that it's stimulating conversation including debate you know we do, sometimes people will talk about things such as in season two when Jesus was preparing a sermon or working through the right words to say and how that really upset some people. The only thing that ever bothered me about that was some people uh, who claimed that they knew exactly what would have happened and what wouldn't have happened and that they have the answer and can settle 2,000 years of debate in a single YouTube comment about the God-man relationship that, or the, the tension or the, 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 you know, the being of who Jesus was, that he was 100% fully God and 100% fully man and what that exactly looked like. So I believe 100% that that's true, but it, what it looked like we didn't know. So those kinds of debates are great. And sincere questions being asked, sincere things being, uh, and even even people, I love, I mean, I've seen a couple of these videos and I've seen a couple that, that are very, uh, that I really like, that, that say, you need to check this against scripture. You need to make sure that you don't replace the Bible with the show. You need to make sure you're talking to your pastor. You need to make sure you're looking to other resources besides the show. 100% agree. We say that ourselves all the time. But I just want to point out, I don't personally care. It doesn't bother me at all. We're not wounded. Some of what we find actually quite entertaining. But what, what I do care about is when you, especially as a fan of the show or as someone who supported the show in some way or paid for the show in some way, um, when you are caught off guard, when, when you see something that's out of context or something that is inaccurate, and I'm telling you, in uh, I've probably been shown or told about you know, I don't know, 20 of these types of videos or, or posts. And I'm telling you, not one, not one has ever yet said everything accurately. Almost every criticism is usually based in some exaggerated version of something that I said or something taken way out of context where they didn't include all the clarity. Look, I have said hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, thousands of hours of things related to this show, related to my faith, related to the Bible. And in those hours, there are always going to be a couple of things that I said that I wish I wouldn't have said, but there's also going to be a couple of things that I'm not, I don't regret saying, but that out of context are going to be much worse or much or confusing uh, much more than they are in context. And so I just want you to remember that, to keep in mind that whether it's things that we've said or things that are in the show that are misunderstood, um, I don't mind legitimate debate. I don't mind legitimate criticism. I welcome it. I think it's healthy. I think it's good but it's when something is exaggerated, taken out of context, or misunderstood, and then willfully projected to the world as fact, that's when it's a problem. And that's what I just want you to remember. If you ever have questions, remember, we answer as many as possibly can on uh, in, in, in uh, our social media accounts. We are happy to answer some of these questions and clear things up, but please just come at it with the form of a question as opposed to an accusation, and just assume and recognize that not everything that you see is in context or is totally accurate. So. We typically try to ignore that kind of stuff. I didn't want to bring this up all the time, but it's really becoming more common. And just in the last month, we've been hearing from a lot of people just saying, hey, I saw this, is this true? Or, uh, you know, or is there controversy happening? Look, we're busy doing the work. We want to reach a billion people with the authentic Jesus, and that's what our focus is on. We don't want to be distracted. We don't want to take time on things like this. But for you, I want to make sure, I, I'm, I feel sometimes protective of you, not in terms of what information you take in. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about you uh, debating, asking questions, all that kind of stuff. I just am very protective of you, at least for the show that you've supported and the show that you are passionate about, that you at least have accurate information. And so what I want you to do too is on our YouTube channel, it's on Facebook as well, but it's not as easy to find. 
Um, and I also believe it's in the app, and if it's not, uh, we'll get it in there. But there's a video that's called either The Chosen Statement of Faith, or You Have Questions About the Chosen. But on our YouTube channel, you can scroll down just a few videos. We just put it out just a couple weeks ago, and it's called currently on YouTube, You Have Questions About the Chosen. And so for, it's about 10 minutes of me just sharing some of the main things that people are asking most questions about. I think it'll give you a really hell good and healthy understanding of where we're coming from. Also answer some of the most common questions or criticisms you get. And then it'll also be the kind of thing you can share with others. So when someone comes to you and says, I heard Dallas said this, or doesn't the show represent this or whatever, you can say, well, here's, here's just this. All I ask is you watch this and see if it addresses some of the questions that you have. Okay, so hopefully that will help and give you a little bit of guidance. But in the meantime, you don't need to, by the way, right now I know in the comments there are people saying, just keep doing it, Dallas, and don't be distracted, don't worry. I promise, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that encouragement. Trust me, you don't need, I, you, I don't actually need it because I, I genuinely am already, we're already on the plan that we're gonna be doing the work that God's called us to do. We're not gonna get distracted. We're not gonna worry about taking all this time to address every single criticism, but we are going to, uh, just for your sake, make sure that you get here from us and hear our hearts. And uh, it's not done from a defensive posture. It's done from a, we want you to have trust and excitement about the show that's come, that has five more seasons. So anyway, that's all I wanted to share about that. We're going to close with this. I want you to meet some of the staff. So everyone who is here, including those of you in the, in the puzzle room, be ready because we're going to do this quick. But I want everyone, here, here's what we got. Sorry about that noise. One by one, we're going to go quickly, but you're going to come up, just share your name and what you do for The Chosen, because I want you to see who uh, the team that is working so hard for you and to get the show out to the world, okay? So uh, we're going to start in just a second here, but this is, again, there's a few of us uh, who couldn't be here, whether it's because of COVID or because of travel problems, uh, who want to be here. Unfortunately, they're not. So this is not the entire team, but this is the majority of the staff that works full-time year-round uh, on social media and special projects. So let's bring them in. Suman, you already met, so you can, you can dive off. You've got to be ready, guys. Let's go. Brad Fogarty, come on. Fogarty, come. Title. Right. We, we don't care about titles, okay. right? Hey, Brad Fogarty. Good so to see you. we brought Brad on just a couple months ago mm -hmm. for some of our staff and what we call our company culture. Mm -hmm. One of Brad's primary jobs, he's got a pastor's heart and he is, uh, he is here to make sure that the people who are working on the show are not getting too stretched thin or getting emotionally wounded or anything like that, that you're, you're really making sure that we remain healthy. And that's one of his primary jobs. He also does like 90 other things because he's got a servant's heart. Um, but Brad, relatively new to the staff and wearing the... Uh, yep. Tie dye. Tie dye. Keep it coming. Next. Keep it coming. Julie. Julie. Go. Where am I looking? Okay. Many, many of you already know Julie. Hi. Julie Molina, who is, uh, I mean, what, title. Does it, do we even have a title? You do it. You do, she does a little bit of everything. She started off as just a big fan of the show and started volunteering just to do commenting on social media. And uh, slowly but surely, we realized that she was awesome. So name and, and what kind of title do you want to give? Chief, chief of staff is kind of a, an official my, my, title. My official title is chief of staff. My unofficial title is um, just support. do what needs to be done. Exactly. Whatever, yeah. whatever it takes, get it done. Yes. Um, and empower Dallas. others. Yeah. But you, you, you not only support. Now, one of the biggest things that she does that's the hardest is she's in the mix with Daryl and me more than anything else. She, she started out kind of as our executive assistant. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and the Lord has rescued her from that. And now she's doing other things as well. But she does everything that needs to be done and empowers others to do. Uh, you have a servant's heart and a heart for others as well. So, yes. I and, love uh, empowering the team. And why don't you say that in uh, two of the other languages you speak? Sure. Um, mi nombre es Julie Molina. Yo trabajo para The Chosen, Los Elegidos. Um, y prácticamente ayudo a, a al equipo y a Dallas y Daryl. Y es un placer poder estar en este equipo. Okay. We. <laughs> I know that's French. Okay, thank you, Julie. Okay. Julie is also a resident. Put administrative assistant and helper to Julie. Right, I'm Jody Quint. Okay, so this is Jody, another uh, someone who was really impacted by the show and reached out to us just to share her heart. And we started thinking, man, I feel like she belongs here. And so she, I think your unofficial title, soon to become official title, Mama Bear. Chosen Mama. Chosen, Chosen Mama. Mama. We can do that. Can do she, that. Jody also makes sure that everyone is taken care of. So uh, she's got a servant's heart here. Keep them coming. Galibe. Yeah, get a little closer to the mic if you don't mind. I'm Galibe. I am a project manager here. 
And project manager means what? What is a project manager? You make sure that things get done. <laughs> yeah, basically there are a lot of moving parts within the chosen, as you can understand, not just from a production standpoint, but from a product standpoint, from a social standpoint. And so I'm in the mix trying to make sure that everything gets done so that the stuff we said we will do and produce and sell to you can be made, produced and sold. Yes, so when I say we're coming soon, he's the one who goes, oh, okay, I'm gonna make sure that actually happens. <laughs> basically. So thank you. Thank you, Billy. Yeah. That was fast. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Dallas. Yes. So, Jenny, what, what's your what's the thing that we always tell? What, what's the thing we always call Jenny? Okay, I'm the photo savant. Yes. So, photo savant. Does she need to get closer to the mic, Colin, or can people? Oh, hear? that's the mic. Oh, that's, yes. Okay. That's the mic. So, here's the reason why we call Jenny photo savant. So, one, uh, she was on. You started out. We started seeing you in the fan club, just making really sharp, funny, witty comments. And so we said we need someone like her to help with the commenting. And so you started helping with commenting. And then you're actually very creative. And uh, sooner or later, she became someone who was starting to design our memes. And so the vast majority of the posts that we do that are pictures with um, word, you know, words on them, those are we called call memes. Them memes. Excuse me, yes, memes. Uh, she's designed most of them. And uh, the reason we call her photo savant is because when you see a picture that matches the caption so unbelievably beautifully, I don't know how you do it. We have how many pictures to choose from between seasons one and two? Thousands. thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands maybe. yeah thousands and thousands and she has them in her head or is able to find i don't it's, even know how i'm it even going to ask very savant -like. yes it is it is savant like and so we call her photo savant and even like the poster book and the calendars and stuff like that when we know we need to collect some of our best pictures we go julie go find the best 25 pictures no, and like 17 Jenny, julie not julie sorry sorry okay, okay. Sorry, Jenny. Sorry, Jerry. It's Jenny. I say, Jenny, go find the best pictures. Okay. And like 18 yeah. seconds later, she's got the best pictures. So, Jenny. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Chris, you make sure you get close to the mic. I'm Chris Song. I'm the behind the scenes uh, shooter and editor. Yeah, so you, uh, you're going to be filming some of the behind the scenes on the set in season yes. three. But when you came on board, you hadn't done any of that. So you I, yeah. Yeah. So, so when you came on board in between seasons two and three, it was primarily as an editor. So That's far. correct. Yes. yes. So Chris is responsible for the majority of the the last fifteen or twenty uh, daily recaps. Um, what's you put your you had a lot to do with the, the video that yeah, we saw three today. Three miracles. Yeah, yes. the three miracles video. That. So he took you know an hour and a half of footage and turned it into twenty five minutes along with all that B roll. He got, he helps go find that B roll. But yeah. Thank you. Chris, on our, which one are you wearing? You're wearing the... Uh, I am wearing the... Which probably by now is gone. Right? Yeah, because we only had a few. Sold out by now. Yes. Yeah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah Smith. And, uh, well, my title is actually a pretty interesting one. Yeah. So when he first came on board, he was kind of like, we, we needed someone to be me where, when I couldn't be, like, to represent me in meetings and brand discussions and all that kind of stuff. And the cloning failed. Yes, yeah, as you can see. <laughs> um, so I was spread way too thin, and uh, Jeremiah has not only a servant's heart, but he's extraordinarily talented and extraordinarily hardworking and gifted. So we brought him on without a defined role, per se. It was like, we just need you to be here and to help make things better. And he's now become kind of chief of brand, like kind of our branding officer, so making sure that everything looks and sounds or how it's supposed to and so we were coming up with titles I, I came up with this little silly one it, instead of a grand poobah I thought brand poobah and it's starting to stick right it's, it, yeah it is going to stick I have a feeling yeah, yeah. yeah it you're works gonna be, it works yeah you're going to be the brand poobah so he is uh, he largely responsible for making sure that things like the Christmas special like the, the, the poster and the pictures that were chosen and the videos that we did the trailers all of that goes through you yeah. and uh, your role is going to continue to wonderful emails reminding you about this live stream. We make sure that they're working and sounding good. So it's, yeah, yeah. A, it's uh, a fun job. Yeah. And you help enact, uh, you help execute and make sure that all of our communication follows our four guidelines, which are what? Our traits. Disruptive, personal, and that's the big no, one. Intimate. Intimate. I'm sorry. Intimate, authentic. And now you've thrown me off. Yeah, yeah, playful. You threw me off. I think you combined intimate with playful. Yeah, so, yeah. So. And, and I think, I think the, the great thing about the brand is I feel like that, that the show, there's the show, and then there's what we do in communications. Right. And it, it is so intimate when we write. We're writing to the individual. And I, it's just such a different thing for a brand to do. Yeah. And it's been, a, it's been a really cool thing that really Dallas started doing. Yeah, but he's helping execute, making sure that we're always talking to you personally and that we don't become some sort of corporate entity that is just 
putting out mark. We, we use the term marketing. I've done that. Yeah, where we're like, that's too markety. Don't do me. Yeah, he actually worked at Walmart. Had a wonderful yeah. time. So. Yeah, that's great. But, uh, but uh, we don't want to be too markety in our communication. So. All right. All right. Let's probably get someone else up here. Yes. Uh, Durbin, they already know because they just met him. Who's next? Catherine. Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Dallas. So Catherine came on board last year. And what is your name, title? Tell uh, us who you are. Catherine Warnock. I live in California. I'm a producer. For the yes. chosen special projects yeah producer for special projects so you're not as much on the the set during the filming of Correct. the actual episodes we have producers for that you are so a lot of the big initiatives that we've done she's produced uh such as the like the theatrical release of the uh of the christmas special like so you the christmas were the special itself and the christmas yeah. special theatrical release yes yeah. um so she was the one who was helping produce the getting all the talent the the the, the, the musicians together and like your team was the one who executed the Christmas special. Yes. Uh, you didn't sing, but you. I wish I could sing, but yeah, you would but all not buy a ticket for yeah, that. Yeah. So you, but you did. You helped make. She makes. She helps make these big things happen, and uh, so a lot of the special events, uh, some of the big initiatives we have in 2022 coming up, year round. You are making sure that the content of the show is replicated in our efforts. Yes. Outside of the show. Yes. So, like, for example, the uh, the big screening we had, that was kind of your baptism by fire. That's r shortly yes. around the time the you NRB. came on board yeah. at uh, the National Religious Broadcasters yeah. when we did episode six, the big screening, and the whole conference, all of that, that was her and her team. So We did it in two weeks. Yeah, she's extraordinary. So thank you, Catherine. And wearing the uh, tie-dye. Bob, who's wearing the T-shirt. <laughs> Bob uh, is B Bob Starnes. Uh, give me name and uh, we, again we don't think so deeply about number. titles. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, but you're Bob Starnes. No, I gave myself a new name while we're standing over there. Okay, I can't wait to hear Our it. New title. I'm www.thechosengifts.com. Oh, I, I, I wasn't look at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was about to cut you off at the pass there. Uh, so Bob Starnes, uh, you are essentially now our gifts guru. Um, we have uh, extraordinary partners such as Brett Parker and his family who run a, a business that uh, services all our, our, you know, the, the warehouse and the shipping and the packaging and all that kind of stuff. And of course, Angel uh, Studios, who does, who's kind of like our, our distribution arm, meaning they, they, they're, they're the ones who run the website and, the, and the, the app. And you're the one who makes sure that everyone is communicating and happy and coming up with ideas for new products and or gifts, as we would call them. Um, but yeah, you're here to make us sane and make sure that we're actually keep yeah. staying on task. Yeah. Right. So. And uh, you, you uh, have uh, the, the the age that he represents. Uh, I know that he's older <laughs> than I am. He's, he's just turned he just turned 52, um, but comes from years and years of experience. And uh, in fact, you used to work. Or you, or you, do you talk about who you've worked with before? Yeah. Like Veggie Tales, right? Yeah. Like J Bob was a, he had a huge hand in all the Veggie Tales gifts and apparel too. And so we brought on his experience to help make sure that things like this actually get done and that the quality is good and the pricing is right and that the shipping from overseas happens and all that stuff. So yep. That's fun stuff. Yes. Okay. And, and also a servant's heart, which is true of everyone in this room. Yeah. All right, who else we got? Hello. Sheila, who we've seen earlier, who's yeah. wearing the, uh, the hoodie, which is probably gone by now, unfortunately. Yeah. But, uh, so Sheila, name and, well, uh, Sheila Perez. I think my name is Sheila Perez, and yeah. I am a project manager with Special Projects. Right. So uh, I, I first met you when I went to Italy. Mm -hmm. So when Jonathan and I went to Italy and had the whole experience there, uh, you were the one who was uh, emailing and texting me every single day to make sure that I was okay. Yes. So the flights are booked and all of that stuff. And you handle yeah. details that I would kill myself before I ever wanted to handle. And uh, very quickly we were like, who's the Sheila person and how can we have her more involved? And uh, so you work with Catherine. I do. So and you and, and Katie, who unfortunately Katie. couldn't be Shout here. Shout out to Katie. She, she was snowed in in, in freaking West Virginia. Yeah. Who wasn't prepared for no. apparently 11 inches of snow. It was too much for them. The planes couldn't even take, take off. She's stuck in the snow. Yeah, yeah, literally. Literally. She's right now lying in snow. Exactly. Yeah, well, like yeah. freezing to death. But she has a chosen hoodie on, so she'll be <laughs> fine. But uh, so you work with Katie a lot, but you guys are kind of the, like if, if, if Catherine is kind of the sheriff, you're the deputies making sure that everything gets yeah. done. Yeah, and uh, like when people were at the movie theater for Christmas with the Chosen, like when I went and did an appearance at the movie theater, you were the one who, who helped make that happen. Correct. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Goodbye. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> All right, who's next? Mac, you need to be ready. ready. Oh, you guys are in line. Great. I'm ready. Literally a line happened. 
name and title, which we don't have official. What's the title? I have to choose. We, have, we don't really have an uh, right. official title yet. Yeah. But you help lead the creative team. Yes. You know, but, My name is Steven. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thrilled to be here. Yeah. So, uh, what is the like the primary thing that you were focused on last year? So with the chosen, a lot of the things are design, gift store design. Um, we did like the key art for the Christmas special, yep. uh, electro electronic press kit yeah. for the Christmas special. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of the bigger picture design projects. Yeah, so I remember when I first, uh, when Stephen first started doing some part-time work, just helping out the project, I just remember thinking, gosh, everything that he's doing is smart and mm -hmm. Uh, intentional and seems to get the brand and and uh, it was very quick that we said we got to bring you on yeah. as much as possible so now he's a full-time official member of the team helps lead the creative team um, your your design work is what is the bulk of what you've done like posters and and uh, memes and and uh, like the websites and stuff but you you do you're doing more than just that like you even speak into some of our video stuff and sure. speak into just the overall look and feel of the chosen brand. Keep right? things as like cohesive and on brand as possible. Make sure we're living within the sandbox of you yes. know, colors and fonts and yeah. all that fun stuff. Yeah, extraordinary talented and musician as well. I am, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and you have a pastor's heart. You weren't you a youth pastor at some point? Yeah, time? I was. I was in full time ministry for eleven years. Yeah, and the last five or so of it was more the media and creative side yeah. but yeah did young adult ministry campus ministry that kind of stuff so and no more ministry for you now you're working on the chosen <laughs> ministry is out the window because we don't do that here no i'm kidding more so, in the ministry now actually you yeah, know really yeah, yeah absolutely. that's how i feel so well, i appreciate that so thank you steven hey, thank you awesome who's next keep it moving okay. larissa Hi, Larissa. Larissa's been with us for a little while. Like you were one of the early ones. I was. Yeah, you were May one of the, 2020. You were one of the tough, tough broads, as we said. Tough, I still yeah. am a tough broad. Yes, but yes. We had, that was the term we had for the women who were kind of managing. All, they all happened to be women. And I started calling them tough broads because they were. So uh, anyway, Larissa, um, do you have a title? I don't know. Do I have a title? You'll probably social get one Social media eventually. team. Yeah, so she's on the social media <laughs> team. So you're not only, when you first came on, you were helping a lot, as everyone does, with commenting, making sure that everyone's responded to. But you've also helped, you've, you've, you're you've now doing a lot more than that um, when it comes to even strategy, planning out. You and Mac uh, work tremendously on the scheduling, right? Yes. So that's the biggest job. You know, how many, how many uh, posts a day do we do across all our channels? Across all our channels, we probably do, let's see. Probably 15 yeah. at least, yeah, you know, yeah. on normal days. Yeah, so, and, and then and including like stories, which are even more, so the, the yeah. videos that you do on our stories. Um, so she has to schedule all of that and it's gotta be done in advance. And so she and the rest of the team, uh, particularly Mac, who we'll hear from in a minute, but uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So like you and you have some of it planned out several days in advance, yep. but then you have to be ready for when I, out of the blue, just decide to change everything. Because Never. I, yeah, okay, good. Um, <laughs> but you are also starting to feature, focus on TikTok. Yes, so, I am. And, and you've uh, been focusing on Twitter as well. Yes. Um, so TikTok, Twitter have been your primary focuses in making just our strategy and making sure that our posts um, uh, fit into our goals for that. In 2022, we are really upping the ante with TikTok. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm so, so excited. You're a big part of that. So Larissa has been here for, did you say May of 2020? Yes. Yeah, so over a year and a half. Yeah. And uh, we adore her, and she's been a very faithful servant to this project. So yeah. thank you. And you're thank wearing you. the uh, teal. The teal. And tie dye. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Or as, yeah, Daryl pronounces it till, because Daryl is from Utah. Mac. Hey, how It's not surprising that you came in <laughs> fast and furious and then came in loud. Mac is our bulldozer. Uh, and you were, you were, were you the first? Second. S Jenny's the original OG. Yeah. So. OT. Yeah. Jeff Brown. And you came in, you came in um, to help organize because you are an organizer. Try and to be, yeah. yeah. And uh, she is tough and tough as nails and can handle us. She, she oftentimes deals directly with me, which is a, a gift of God. Scary. Yeah, scary. I get, I, I get fired on a regular basis, so. Yeah, I fire her every day. Uh, almost every day. And, yeah. and when he doesn't, um, I, I have to ask to be fired because that's like that's yeah. like your love language yes. for me. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, inside <laughs> joke, but yes, I do. Uh, we love Max. She's been, how long have you been around? Uh, I've been around since approximately, I think you and I started uh, communicating like the day after Thanksgiving of 2019. Yeah. 
So she essentially, like, do you have a title now? Uh, I do, uh, a project manager, but that's kind of lame. Yeah. So we're going to call this, uh, Larissa is director of TNT because it's TikTok and Twitter. Yeah. So TNT but you are kind of the, the, the coordinator of social media. So you are the one who like supervises the scheduling. You supervise the calling, calling of content. I put the big puzzle together. Yes. And then you come to me and you say, okay, these are the next five posts. Uh, the captions that have been yeah. written for them, or do you approve of those? Do you want to tweak them? Then I tweak them, and you communicate back to the team some of the things that I'm saying. And so, yeah, it's... Communications director. Yeah. Is there anything in social media that doesn't go through you at some point? Uh, TikToks. TikToks yes. don't go through me. Yeah, but everything else seems everything to, at else some point, goes through you. Goes through me. And she's just, she's a freaking bulldozer. <laughs> just make sure that everything gets done. I'll take and, that as a compliment. Yes, no, it's I'm awesome. a little, but I'm a bulldozer. Yes, absolutely. So, thank you. And you were yes. wearing the tie-dye. I am wearing the sturdle. Also, yes. as well, you're binge Jesus hat. Of course. Yeah. I never get away with that hat. Shout out to members that are not here. I've, I've done that. Okay. Yeah, I've mentioned that a couple times. Yep. Uh, Adam? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hey. Adam, our COO, um, Adam Swerdlow, who came on board back in 2019, right? 2020. 2020, yeah. I keep forgetting that this is 2022. And uh, your life has been transformed by working on the show, but uh, more than anything, you have transformed us in many ways by making sure that all the finances are in order, making sure that money is spent wisely, make sure that we take, I mean, you can talk about this, but like when they pay it forward, when they buy a gift, you are the one who makes sure that it is stewarded properly because we take this so seriously. Big responsibility, for sure. Yeah. Um, again, PIF is sacred to the production of the show. PIF, pay it forward. We call exactly. it PIF. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and then GIFTS uh, makes all of this possible that you've been seeing everybody. So yeah. um, we take huge uh, responsibility to make sure it's stewarded correctly to make sure that what you see on screen uh, is what's meant to be there. So. And he's also currently, even though this will eventually will give him more, get him more help to do this, but manages our human resources and all of our insurance for the company and just making sure that the employees are taken care of properly and cared for. And uh, what's cool about Adam is that he not only is a, a guru and a genius when it comes to finances and logistics, but has a servant's heart and wants to help and wants to love on people, and which is not always common. So. Well, thank you, Dallas. Yes. Couldn't pick a better place. So, we're glad Adam's here. All right, who's next? Colin. Colin, just come around from behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Colin prefers to be behind the camera. Uh, few few indeed, words. Indeed. No. So um, it's not bad up here, though. Yeah, yeah. I can get used to this. Yeah. And what is your what is your uh, your name is Colin? Obviously, what's your yes. title? Uh, I'm Colin McLeod. I'm the behind the scenes producer, live stream producer. Yeah, yeah. So Jenkins I, IT. Yes. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when our, our my kids all love Colin, they always say Colin's a real man because <laughs> every time that I'm the one who's like. Uh, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to fix that. And Colin comes over because Colin has moved here to Midlothian where we've moved. And uh, you had just help anything that's going wrong in our house. Sometimes he'll just help out, uh, particularly in the IT field because I am a moron. But uh, I actually have known Colin for what, 10 years now at least? 11 uh, years? 11, 11 yeah. years now. So yeah. when I went back, I had a job at Harvest Bible Chapel in Chicago. I was in charge of all media. And Colin was one of my first hires in the video department. Worked for me for six, seven years. Yeah. Six yeah. years maybe. And then I uh, ended up having a job at another place, uh, Tyndale Publishers. And then uh, I eventually poached you for The Chosen. We started uh, gearing up. And so I've known Colin for a long time. He's the one who, when you hear me saying, Colin, am I on? Colin, are we good? He's the one who's back there running everything, making sure that the live stream is happening, making sure, make sure that everything is lit properly, managing and keeping track of all the equipment, and also helping run the video team, which have now is bulked up. Yeah. We have multiple people who are editing and all the behind the scenes stuff that you see captured on the set. Um, you, if, if you didn't shoot it yourself, you were supervising the people who were and organizing all that content. I mean, how many, do you have a guess of how many hours of content we got gosh. from season two of The Chosen uh, behind the scenes content? Oh gosh, I mean, it's hours. I, I guess I think in like terabytes. I mean, it's like, no, <laughs> like, no. Nerd alert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we got hundreds, hundreds of hours of footage. Oh, it's, it's gotta be yeah. more than that, right? Yeah, because you gotta think about it, it's probably 15 <clears throat> hours a day between yep. the two cameras. So yeah, for sure. Maybe we have like uh, we have two to three videographers on on set shooting, you know, at you know all day long, twelve hours a day, alongside yeah. the production team. And yeah, I mean that's that's what we use to produce all the great YouTube content. And yep. So. Yeah. So what we we release two new full length videos. What you know, usually three to seven minutes long a week, that come out on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. 
excuse me, your Instagram, not only do you make a lot of those or your team does, but then you have to edit them to fit each of the different social media channels. So Instagram has a different framing than Facebook and all of the, the um, subtitles, like all of those are subtitled and you make sure that that happens. So it's quite a huge yeah, job. So I, I do a lot. Yeah. Huh? Now that you're realizing it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, you did, you were the primary owner of the making of the, the season two, the heart of the yeah, season two. Heart video. of the chosen. Heart yeah. of the chosen yeah. for season two. That, that, turned that was awesome. Yeah. Turned out pretty great. I'm yeah. awesome. Yeah. He's, this is why we don't put him on camera too often. No. But uh, so now we're, we're, because we're going to wrap up the live stream, I do need you to now right. sit behind the camera and start pressing buttons. And then, uh, and then he'll, Colin is about to shift. Oh, Pella didn't come? Perfect. We got one more. That's right. What I was told is that the food's all cold and everyone's waiting to eat. Yeah. So, so be quick, right? Okay. Brad so, Pello. Brad Pello. Bodyguard therapist to to Dallas. Yes, and I just mentioned Brad in the video that you saw when I talk about the three miracles, and Brad is the one who uh, you, I would say your wife even before you, I feel like your wife woke up one morning and just was like, yeah. you need to devote the next few years of your life to the chosen. Is that about accurate? That's Brad brilliant. could retire. Brad could be done with all. He's done more uh, in his life than, than uh, any, any of us combined and uh, could retire, um, but has felt called to serve the chosen and uh, has become a mentor to me, um, a leader in our team. Uh, he has, uh, and as I mentioned to you in the video, that he kind of he listened to God's voice in uh, helping make things happen to get us the set and helping make things happen when it comes to distribution. So you don't, right now you don't have a title. Uh, you've had multiple titles over the last year and a half because he was also working at Angel Studios and helping them, and now he's helping us, and uh, it's been all over the place. But you just it's pleasure. Yeah, it's leadership, mentorship, servanthood. Uh, you know, you uh, the 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 last two Christmas specials um, were kind of a shared maybe brainchild in terms of the original concept. But then you were the one who made it happen. And uh, Brad was someone who came along at a time when we were so busy doing other things we couldn't do some of these extra things that that, that we thought were valuable, but we just couldn't pull them off. And then Brad made them happen. So uh, yeah. So well, now one of the key leaders of The Chosen and will continue to help grow our, our uh, efforts and resources and make sure that everything gets done properly. Good job, Brad. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'll swap the board. I'm hungry. Yes. And to say, and to, 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 you're, we're, we're, is this the last, you are the last one? I am the last one. The All first right. shall be last and the last shall be right. first. So let's real quick, before we sign off, remind them of thechosengifts.com. There is so much at thechosengifts.com. We have all this great mer uh, gifts. You almost, said, you almost said the M word, but it's gifts. And uh, the Bible study, which is awesome. And uh, the chosen Bible study for season two, Blessed Are the Chosen, um, is now out along with all this gear. And keep in mind, I know you, we have probably run out of some of the items. Um, just There are other items that you can get as well. We will get, as soon as they're available, we'll get them back. But right now, the, meet, the featured thing is this church, uh, season, season two Bible study. But uh, I'm really excited for this year. I'm really, really excited for this year. And I can't wait for you all to see a lot of the stuff that we have planned, especially really going after the unreached. That's where our hearts have always been. Yep. And uh, I just love seeing the impact of the show. Yeah, and a heightened focus on Generation Z, Gen Z this year, which has been your heart yes. from the beginning of this show. I want to reach that generation. I want to reach that generation. And uh, because it's challenging and to, to, uh, sometimes because they're in sometimes places that we don't naturally reach, like on Facebook right. and whatnot, uh, we haven't done it to the extent that we're going to do it in 2022. So. Yeah, I, I can't wait. And I can't wait for this to really impact that generation because it's one of the most amazing generations of all time. And yeah. they'll know how to really take us to a billion people. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, Daryl, uh, from the beginning, been a partner on this project. So he and I are joined at the hip from now until Jesus comes. And uh, uh, you're, one of the things that's awesome about Daryl is that reason, one of the reasons you don't see him a whole lot in these live streams is because that's not what he cares about. Um, he's from the beginning was saying, Dallas, you need to be out there. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be behind the scenes, making sure that things get, get done. And he has a servant's heart. And what's funny is Daryl actually said, um, when you first saw this project, yeah. said, I need to be involved. I don't care if I just have to hold the light. <laughs> I want to be involved. And sure enough, I'd love to find this picture. I don't know if you have access to it, Colin. So maybe while I'm talking about it, I can give you time to find this picture, but there is a picture of you literally holding the light for the photo shoot 
of the Chosen Christmas special poster, the one of Mary and Joseph, and he's literally holding the light for that picture. And uh, it's just such a such yeah. an awesome statement because uh, it represents what you, your passion has been. And then, of course, your heart's cry, what God has called you to do, is to spread light. And when you even said, I'm willing to hold the light, that wasn't even, you didn't even mean that as a metaphor. No. But not only are you holding the light, you're actually holding the light out to illuminate um, light in the darkness. So, yeah, join at the hip. So should we sign off? Sign off. So uh, what do I normally say to end all of these live streams? It's not your job? Tell them. Oh, it's not your job <laughs> to feed the 5,000. It is only to provide the loaves and fish. We love you. God bless. Thank you. Down in the water, watch the mud rise up. Dress me like a lamb for the slaughter, pour me in your cup. Should have known we'd bring trouble, and trouble gonna find you here. Trouble. I was one way when you found me, I was not the one you see. And the only thing that happened was this stranger here. And you can say your eyes are open You might think your hands are clean Till the wind blows in Dirt kicks up in ways you've never seen Till I'm scraping the bottom, make my well run dry. Shake them coins, I know where you got them. Kiss me, kiss me by. I should have known we'd bring trouble. Trouble gonna find you here. Yeah, trouble. Stranger in between You can say your eyes are open You might think your hands are clean Till the wind blows in The dirt kicks up In ways you've never seen Oh